welcome to the Drexel interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohn, and today our guests are Mark Lyons and Jimmy Santiago Baca, co contributors to the new bilingual book, Espejos y Ventanas, or Miras and Windows, a collection of oral histories by Mexican farm workers in the United States. Mark Lyons is a writer and a health worker serving Philadelphia's Latino community. Jimmy Santiago Baca is an award-winning fiction writer and poet, as well as an advocate for Mexican and Latino rights in the United States. Mark and Jimmy, welcome to the Drexel interview. Thank you. Uh, Jimmy Santiago Baca, I wonder if you would begin by reading a poem or reciting a poem about farm workers. Sure. I'm going to read. Look at this lovely, lovely book cover. Look at that. That's yes, a, that's it is a, lovely. It's an awesome, it's a mosaic of all these people's experiences. You can see it in the expressions of the faces, aren't they? Are these the real people fi that figure in the book? Yeah, Are these so, photographs right, right, of right. them? Yes. They're made by Cesar Vero Herrera, who's a mural artist here in Philadelphia. Yeah. And each of those actually is a face that's seven feet high. Really? Wow. It is then put into a collection uh, for the cover of the book. Okay, yeah. great collage. Yeah, well, yeah. Mosaics. Mosaics. Mosaic. Yeah, yeah, mosaic. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it has a more spiritual more meaning to it than a collage. Mosaic. Okay, here goes. Now, this is Enrique Cortazar's poem, and uh, uh, so I'll be reading it, and so I'll, Enrique, forgive me if, if I botch it in any way, because he's a great Mexican now, poet. Now, did he translate it? Are you reading it in English, I take it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's bilingual. The entire book is bilingual. Okay. It's called Undocumented, Alone, Facing Foreign Lights, He Hears Whispered Voices Distantly. This bridge takes you to oblivion. It changes your name. Nothing will be yours now, so listen to the departing train for the last time and the wind rubbing against the evening, for nothing will be yours now. And when you return, you'll bring under your fingernails your touch, your breath, the feeling of having visited the underside of your dreams where secrets become pain. Nothing will be yours now, as were the games of childhood in your imagination, those village gardens. That very memory will become bitter and happy. That's a beautiful poem. Thank you. It's sad and happy. Yes, yes, you come yeah. back with a dual, with, you come back, Anytime you, the Mexicans, when they come here, they come here and they, what was dormant, they energize. What was cloudy, they fill with light. And you can almost see the footsteps that on, on the paths they take become the aisles for young, young people to get married on. They just have such a fruition in their passage. Well, that's eloquent. It sounds yeah. like a poem in itself. Well, it's because I, I, when I want good poems, yeah. I follow the migrants. Okay. Well, I, I would say that people in this country know a lot about um, Mexican farm workers in California, thanks to Cesar Chavez, but we know less about what's going on right around here, south of Philadelphia in Kennett Square, um, and that's what you have compiled in this book, the stories mm -hmm. of these farm workers. Mark Lyons, um, tell us about these people who are, uh, mush they work for the mushroom growing industry in that area. And tell us why they're here. Why is it that the, this industry has chosen to hire them and not American citizens? Well, it's an interesting history that really mirrors the history of immigrants that have come to this country for the last 150 years. And in a lot of ways, is mirroring the history of immigrants that are traveling from Turkey to Switzerland or from Morocco to Holland or from Haiti to the Dominican Republic. The mushroom industry in Kennett Square started 100 years ago. And the original mushroom owners were Quakers who brought over poor Italians hmm. who worked in the industry for 30 or 40 years. The Italians then became owners themselves or moved on to other jobs. And they began to hire poor white people from the community who worked in that industry for 10 years or so. But they began to leave to get better jobs. So then they brought in African Americans and poor white people from the South in the 30s, from the 30s to the mid 50s. Hmm. They were primarily indigenous migrants who came to work there. But they moved up and out to the factories in the Northeast, et cetera. 
So then they brought farm workers from Puerto Rico, who in the 70s and early 80s were the dominant workforce there. Mm -hmm. But they also left. So then the next group of people who they turned to, as has the industry, the migrant worker industry, and the rest of the world, or in the rest of the country, uh, has used Mexican, primarily Mexican migrant workers forever, uh, began to bring uh, Mexicans, and now 98% of hmm. the workers there are Mexicans. So here. this is the latest phase in an evolution <coughs> in this area. Right. Okay. Exactly. And do you feel it's temporary, and that will it will again evolve to another point, and the the Mexican workers will become so will the be owners? The next wave? Yeah. Well, it's it's very interesting. There are sort of two waves. Mm -hmm. uh, a group of a large group of Mexican migrant farm workers, including the mushroom workers got amnesty in 86 uh, and were able then to get a green card and many of those people moved on to other jobs, although some of them, including people in the book, are still working in the industry. Yeah. And they left and sort of created a vacuum and there's a new wave of Mexican workers who are coming, mostly who are undocumented, mostly yeah. originally who are single men who live in camps, who eventually their goal is to get documentation and bring their families as well. It's not clear who the new wave is. In other industries, such as in Haiti, they bring in Haitian temporary farm workers, Dominican temporary farm workers mm -hmm. to cut cane. You know, that may be the next the, Okay, the next that's wave. interesting. Um, Jimmy Santiago Baca, you have said often that writing was for you connected to a kind of spiritual awakening um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. during very tough periods in your life, periods spent in prison and, you know, uh, on the streets and mm -hmm. so forth. What does it mean, do you think, for these workers to tell their stories? I mean, what is your view of narrative and storytelling as an empowering tool for an individual? Um, wow. Um, it's, it's almost as integral to the life of a person, of a healthy person, as it is for our climate to have the sun rise in the east. Mm. Yeah. Storytelling. You know what? And this is it. Look, I, I, I've... Uh, I've been affiliated with, with Yale and Berkeley and Stanford and universities all over the world, esteemed universities, and held many, many chairs. And when I talk to a colleague of mine about, about a project like this, I get a sunburned response, almost like sun-baked clay in Oklahoma there in the Dust Bowl. People become hardened by, 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 by not allowing themselves to open up their heart and believe, again, in the dream that they had when they were young. Yeah. So when I'm working with migrant workers, one of the things that keeps me going back to them, I'll tell you a very interesting story. One of the things that keeps me going back to them is that they energize the language with a passion. Why that's is that? Connected, it's directly connected to their waking in the morning and their sleeping at night. They have to sleep and they have to use language in a way that they energize it because they've, they've spent so much sweat and blood and tears. Do you think it's because it. they need the language so much? They need... They need they're well, they need the language, but, but, but they're redefining for us what the American dream is. They're redefining the promised land mm. because we've become very callous to it. How many kids do you know that come to the universities or professors that teach in certain universities or businessmen that own businesses have even the slightest clue about the American dream, what its, what its, what its major points are, what the constitutional rights are? These Mexicans I talk to can tell you what the American dream is huh. because every single day they get up, that's why they're sweating in the fields. That's why they're packing mushrooms in the canneries. That's why they're in the warehouses boxing up mushrooms. Because they're pursuing the American dream, and it's not for them. They'll give their entire life. This is what amazes me as a poet. They'll give their entire life so that their daughter can one day walk in the halls of Drexel. Hmm. And I'm like, oh, wait a second. You're going to give 60 years of your labor and take half of your pay and put it away, even though you're getting only half of what the minimum wage is, and you're doing it under the duress of maybe the INS coming and taking you away, under those, that threat, you're still going to go to work, and you're still going to bring back the pay, and you're still going to put in the coffee can, so that one day your daughter can get an education? That's inspiring. And I'm like, yeah. that, that's the kind of American dream that I want to be part of. Right. And that's why Espejos, this book, mm -hmm. that's why when, uh, when Mark and, and Steve and the folks invited me to come on it, I'm, I'm extremely busy. I have like five, six major projects working with His Holiness the Dalai Lama on one project with Richard Gere and a bunch of other people involved mm -hmm. worldwide, right? Doing all this. I have new books, this and that. I have a movie. Everything dropped to, to come out and participate in this book because it's a celebration 
not a criticism, but a celebration of these people's fortitude and their courage and their, their compassion and their... It sounds like it's a celebration of the idea of America, too. The well, idea the, in the best sense. Oh, in the best sense it yeah, is. Yeah, that's wonderful. In the best sense it is. I, every single night, I, Lou Dobbs criticizes Mexicans for at least 10 minutes. It's become a policy in his program on CNN. Mm -hmm. Every single night. And I'm thinking, it must be a terrible, terrible way of getting up in the morning when, when all you can do is criticize the, the, the least powerless and the hardest working people in the country, right? For some strange reason, I'm not sure. But when I was reading this book here, Mirrors and Windows, if you just look at this one little tiny thing on what, the, what, the, uh, what Mark and, and Steve and these people wrote, this is just one thing that's just absolutely amazing to me. And it's about why they did what they did and how it pertains to the community. This is it, look at this little beautiful sentence here. We believe that through the inclusion of these voices into daily life, alternative ways of speaking, writing, and communicating can express themselves ultimately, reinvigorating and re-envisioning the promise of a community that really is a community. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if he's talking about in this little passage, making our communities healthy, then I'm all for it because when I was in Camden the other day, I love those people, but the communities are withering. Yeah. The houses are boarded up, the kids are on the streets. So this, if this kind of book will reinvigorate and re-envision my community, I'm for it because we need to do something with, for the communities that are slowly being dismantled by poverty, racism, drug addiction, illiteracy. Yeah. This is yeah. the book. Okay, if, if I yeah, something. Mark. One of the, the way we did the stories is we recorded them, we transcribed them, we translated them, we created a story out of their narr our narrative out of the interviews we did. Then I would take them back and read them paragraph by paragraph to people to make sure that that's what they wanted to say. Right. Uh, if they want to make any changes, that kind of thing. The first two people I interviewed were older men in their 50s and early 60s. Mm -hmm. About halfway through reading them, I looked up and they were crying. Oh. And they just, they said, you have to stop a minute. And they just cried and cried and cried. And I said, you know, tell me why you're crying. And they said, I didn't realize that my story could feel so important. Mm. And to hear my story told gives me a whole different way of looking at my life. It really was a mirror in a espejo mm -hmm. for them. There was one of the people who I interviewed was a 16-year-old kid, and I read the story, and for 10 minutes after the story, he was just silent. I just waited with him. I, did, I decided just to let him be. And I asked him, so what are you feeling? And he said, I didn't know I had so much to say. And I asked him to tell me what your mother would think when she reads a story in Mexico. He's supporting his entire family. And eventually, over the two years since I've interviewed him, has built a brand new house for his family with money earned up here working 85 hours a week uh, picking mushrooms. And I said, what would your mother think when she reads the story? And she said, she's going to be very proud of me. She's going to be very proud of our story. And she had resisted him, didn't want him to go, which is part of the whole That's fascinating. Story. So these people, you interviewed them, they didn't realize in a way that they were telling stories in some cases. They don't think their stories are important. Yeah. You know, and then and, when and, they know, read it, back it to validating them their own story. It, it is empowers really them. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. if I can just add something. I was yeah. in Chicago last night reading at the university there, mm -hmm. and uh, I read part of this book to the audience. And after, after I had read it, I had seven kids come up to me. Maybe there was like 11, I'm not sure. I'm thinking there was seven. But I had seven kids come up to me and ask me for the book because they wanted to tell their story too now. Hmm. And, I, and because they, to them, it was an immense impossibility huge obstacle they could never do. And when they heard some of these stories, it inspired. they said, I could tell my story. And then the teacher was with them. And the teacher came up and said, that'd be a great project for my kids. So already it's working its magic in these people who don't even know they have a voice. But the reason that it works as magic, I think, and I'm just building on what Mark said here, is that there's nothing worse in life than to go through life an unknown person.